Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Inc., New York's Window Company, New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Beechwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, M&T Bank, Must Development, LLC, Des Moines Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, W Financial Mortgage Fund, the Wickoff Group. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller. New York City is real estate, and you know there, there are people in the real estate business all over, but the, the, some people are called the conciliers, the, the, the counselors, the, the, the guys who really put the deals together. So today I'm really honored to have Jonathan Mechanic, the chairman of the real estate practice for the firm of Freed, Frank, Havers, Shriver, and Jacobs. Jacobson. Uh, thanks for being here today. Happy to be here, Michael. So, you know, how old are you now? 57. 57 years of age. You were born in Patterson, New Jersey. I was. Uh, and you were raised in Patterson. Your dad, uh, your late dad, uh, Mayor, was a dentist, but also had a little interest in real estate, right? What, what did he do? Uh, he also developed property on the side, independent of his practice. And he, he once took over a shop, right? He took over a vacant shop right in uh, Waldwick, New Jersey, and uh, thought of it as an office building, put up a sign, was all set, you know, to go forward, and uh, I had a gentleman see the sign, call him, make an appointment to come see him, uh, very discreet, showed up in a little VW, didn't want to name the name of the company, turned out to be IBM, and uh, IBM then leased the whole building from him, and that was the beginning of his dabbling in real estate. Now, you, your mother was an entrepreneur also. Your mother was uh, King Auto Parts. What was that? All right. My mother, there was a family business that goes back to my grandfather uh, on my mother's side, and my grandfather died relatively young in his mid-40s, and my grandmother stepped into the business, and then my grandmother died relatively young. So my mother, in her early 20s, stepped into the business in an industry that was dominated by males and uh, ran the business for 50 years. Now, you, you, so you grew up in Patterson, but then you moved to Ho Hocus? When I was 17, yeah, but I left with co for college, okay. and my family moved to Hocus. But before that, I, th I think the interesting thing, you, you know, certain people, you know, decide, you, you went to Yavner Academy, uh, a yeshiva, uh, which is unusual for you, but then, but then you decide. You know, you finish high school. You know, junior high school. Some people decide that you, they're going to, you know, become in real estate or something else. And you, you decided to go to yeshiva high school in Washington Heights. Did you want to see the real estate in Washington Heights? <laughs> I didn't find the real estate in Washington Heights that compelling, but it must have been an initial draw to the city of New York, which I love. Um, I went to University High School for a year. Um, it was a little bit too restrictive so for you me, didn't, so, the, so you, it wasn't you, a perfect match. You went match. to practice law as opposed to being the rabbinate. It, it's absolutely. Uh, I, I knew I, I knew I had, a, I had a much better place practicing law than practicing the rabbinate. So, so now you graduate high school, uh, your parents moved to Hohokus, and you decide to go to Brandeis. 
How do you decide to go to Brandeis? I mean, it's a great school, but... It was a, it was a great school. It was outside of Boston, but so it was a suburban school, but it had a major city uh, nearby. It was far enough away from home so that I had the you know, uh, college experience of being away from home. By the same token, it was a you know, four hour drive. I mean, to the New famous York. Justice Brandeis. In the, no. the famous Justice Brandeis, who, who I have a great deal of respect for, and I studied at great length when I was in, in uh, law school. Now, when you were in high school and law school, you even worked part time for your mother's business? I did, including driving a truck. Yeah, and uh, during the summers uh, and even during the semester, you traveled abroad, right? I did. I spent my junior year at uh, studying economics at the University of Manchester. And then I spent my one semester of my senior year um, at a program uh, run by the University of Geneva relating to the United Nations. So, so here's the situation. Here's the guy whose father was a dentist, and y you know your mother was in the auto parts, and you know you went to Brandeis, and as you said to me when we met, you know either you became a physician or you became an attorney. How did you decide to, to to go to NYU Law after graduating from? Well, I never really liked the sight of blood. And uh, although my father would have been very happy for me to succeed him in the dental practice, I decided that I had more uh, talent in the legal world and in the world of debate and the world of advocacy. So you, you graduate uh, Brandeis, you go to NYU three years, and one summer you said you worked for that small law firm, Wild Gottschall. I did. I worked for a summer, my, son, my second summer I was at Wild Gottschall. Uh, then you graduate. Uh, I spent a summer, my first summer I worked for a judge in New Jersey, second summer I was at Wild Gottschall, my third summer I went out to LA to sample LA life to see if that was compelling for me, but I decided I loved New York. So you graduate and then you go and you decide to clerk for a, ju for a judge? I clerked for Judge Robert Carter in the Southern District of New York. Uh, judge Carter uh, had been the general counsel of the NAACP and had uh, argued together with Thurgood Marshall uh, the Brown v. Board of Education case, which is obviously one of the seminal desegregation cases. So now you're, you're a clerk, and you know, yeah, I mean, the only real estate involvement you had was you know, watching your dad you know, take care of certain real estate projects in New Jersey. Now you join the, the famous Freed Frank firm, this white shoe uh, law firm, Wall Street firm, and how do you get into the real estate department? Uh, Fried Frank, first of all, had a long storied real estate history. Uh, it was unusual in that the named partners at Fried Frank, Walter Fried was a real estate lawyer, in fact was responsible for the co-oping of many of the buildings up and down the Central Park West. And Frank was a tax lawyer with a lot of real estate tax. Um, when I came to Fried Frank, Fried Frank had a, and still has, a rotation system where if someone has multiple interests, you can go and spend six months in the corporate department and six months in the litigation department and decide what you want to do. So I thought it would be helpful to have some background in real estate, although I'd really come there to litigate, um, which is kind of the path, you graduate law school, get a prestigious clerkship in the Southern District of New York, and then go to a big firm to litigate. But I spent time in the real estate department. I really liked what I was doing. And I uh, found a mentor, um, uh, a gentleman by the name of Hal Rosen, who ultimately became the head of the department and really was uh, a major you, player you, for you, me. You, you told me, I think part of it was you finished the rotation, and then I think it was Hal who took you to One New York Plaza? He did. Hal took me down to One New York Plaza. We were building out space in One New York Plaza, which is a building on the tip of Manhattan overlooking the harbor and the Statue of Liberty. And the building was under construction, our space was under construction, and Hal, who was pretty persuasive, walked me into the space and walked me over to a beautiful office overlooking the Statue of Liberty, and as was his way, he said, listen, I want you to do what's best for you, and I don't really want to influence you, but the way I see it, you have uh, two choices. You could you know, spend the rest of your career working with me, doing fabulous deals, lots of transactions, high profile in the city of New York, sitting in this office overlooking the Statue of Liberty. He said, or, you know, at that point in time, there were a lot of contested uh, tender offers. And he said, you could be the 20th fellow on a team of litigators doing a contested tender offer located in some, you know, remote city in the United States. And it's totally up to you. I don't really want to influence you. I want you to do whatever's best for you. 
Um, so having considered that for a little bit and looked out of the statue and looked at the gentleman who I knew was my mentor and I thought would be a great way to learn about the real estate business, I, uh, I stayed with Hal. Now, you stayed with Hal, and, and what makes you a little different than many of the other chairmen of the real estate practices in New York and around the country is that Hal also had experience. He worked for Leonard Stern at Hearts Mountain. And then Hal and you decide after a couple of years that it's time for you to go into the real estate business, actually in the real estate business, and you go to work for the legendary Harold Ronson. Right. We, uh, Hal had represented uh, Howard Ronson when we were at Food Frank, and I did a lot of work for Howard as well. And then, and Hal had that experience having worked with Leonard Stern for, I think, seven or eight years before he came to Food Frank. And Howard made us uh, an offer to come to work with him. We both left. And uh, working with Howard was an unbelievable experience. I spent so, five so years there. But what happened was, you, the two of you left, but Hal left before you. He went back to Freed Frank. Correct. We both left together and then um, the dynamics between Hal and Howard weren't perfect and after about six months Hal decided to go back to Freed Frank um, and Howard uh, first induced me to stay for 90 days as a transition and then made me the proverbial offer you can't refuse and at that point in time I wasn't married, I didn't have kids it was a unique opportunity to so have an equity. It didn't matter if you worked 24 hours. It didn't matter if I worked 24 <laughs> hours a day. Exactly. Yeah, you know? that's, but you had really some interesting times because now you, you really were able, I mean, Howard was building buildings. So you were building buildings, which we'll talk about in a second. You were negotiating leases. So you had all this practical experience. What buildings were, were you involved with? Um, Howard, when I was working with them, built uh, one exchange plaza, which is about 300,000 square feet downtown at 55 Broadway, 45 Broadway Atrium, Broad Financial Center, which is at 33 Whitehall Street, uh, Financial Square, which uh, is uh, over on, uh, uh, on the uh, west side, just off the highway, it's a million square foot building, um, and Tower 56, which was a boutique type building, about 150,000 square feet on 56 between Park and Lex. So it's 1986 now, just before the, 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 the la one of the, one of the, the, la the, the, the prior crash. The prior uh, real estate crash. And, uh, you know, Mr. Mechanic says, you know, hey, maybe I want to change. So you go to lunch with one of your friends, uh, a partner, at Josh Mermelstein, Josh Mermelstein and uh, you're, you're having lunch with Josh, and Josh is saying to you, you know, we're, we're looking for somebody, you know, who has a, uh, what happened? Uh, Josh and I were, were very good friends, and we would have lunch periodically, and Josh said to me, you know, we're, we're unbelievably busy. It was actually at the end of lunch. We're unbelievably busy, and um, we're really looking for a mid-level partner to come help us because we can't carry the workload, but we're very sensitive about who, who is because you know it's such a collegial group we want to have the right person they've got to be smart enough talent enough but they also have to have the right chemistry with the balance of the group and you see a lot of people so if there's somebody out there that you think would be a right right fit w for us could you kind of give us a lead on who you think that might be and uh, I said you know I think I have the perfect guy he said well tell me about him I said well it came out of a big Wall Street firm he's been working as general counsel to a developer in New York and I, I hear he's actually going back into practice. And he said, well, what firm did he come from? I said, well, he came from Freed Frank. So there was about a 10 second pause. His eyes go wide. He said, would you really come back? I said, you know, I would certainly consider it. And uh, he said, well, let me, uh, let me try and arrange that. And there were some issues with how when I stayed at, with Howard Ronson and how went back to Freed Frank. So we, we needed to get past that issue. Yeah, but you had said Hal had remarried, and the interesting thing was when Hal's wife gave birth, you had sent him a little note that uh, they had named the, uh, the child Jonathan, and it was a good suggestion, right? All right. About a year before this happened, Hal had, had gotten, he had gotten married. Um, originally, I don't think they planned on having children, and then they decided to have children. Their first child was a boy, and they named the boy Jonathan. And I, you know, and Hal and I had been so close that I sent them a note, I sent them beautiful flowers and a note that said, obviously you have tremendous taste in 
name selection. So you, you go back to Free Frank, is this before you met Wendy or after? I met Wendy when we were much younger. We, were, we actually grew up in the, in the same town in Patterson, New Jersey. Wendy was the younger sister of my tennis partner in high school. We used to play on the tennis team together. And uh, we had dated a couple times while I was in college and then kind of gone our different ways but always stayed friends. And then we had reconnected in my 30s and started dating one another. And I had, was dating her very seriously while I was working for Howard. Um, and then came back to Free Frank and we got married when I had already come back to Free Frank. So you joined Free Frank in 1987 again. Right. And um, then in about 1980, 1997, you become chairman of the real estate department, Correct. which today has about 60 real estate attorneys around the country. 40 I think that's right. The, the interesting thing, and what I said at the opening of the show with the conciliar comment, which I really mean because people have the highest regard for you, is that you have been involved in the structuring and in some of the major deals. I mean, one deal, which I still think is a great deal, you were involved, and that's when you were called the deal maker of the year by American Lawyer, uh, was uh, the deal for um, Stytown. Correct. So, uh, which was the largest purchase uh, price ever for a property uh, in 2006. Then you said to me, some of the other notable transactions that you've been involved with uh, was uh, MetLife's sale of 200, of 200 Park. Park Avenue, which is the MetLife building, which still today is the MetLife building because part of the transaction was maintaining the signage, which you can see from all over New York coming up Park Avenue, down Park Avenue, is the MetLife building, and we represented Tishman Spire and. There was a you know a lot of competition for the building. It was uh, you know the location is a perfect location for people coming into the city, commuting into Grand Central. I mean they're basically at the building. Uh, Tishman Spire had a view as to how it would r modify the building, how it would change the retail downstairs, how it would change the sign, it, how it would upgrade things, and it you know came down to one of those overnight sessions with MetLife, which is kind of the standard fare if you're doing a deal with MetLife. And doing that, working on the financing, working with the Tishman Spire folks, and being able to uh, you know, accomplish getting a transaction like that done was one of those hallmarks that you always remember in your career. Then you also remember the interesting story. I mean, the Lipstick Building has a number of stories about it. Uh, and recently it has the other story because it was where Bernie Madoff's office was. Yes, it was. Uh, but you were involved with Tishman Spire, uh, like cradle to grave on that one, right? Right. We represented Tishman Spire buying the Lipstick Building. Um, then we negotiated a deal with Latham and Watkins, which is the major tenant in the building. So we did the lease with Latham, and then we turned around and sold the building at a point in time, and that, I would say, was kind of the height of the market before we suffered some of the reverses we've experienced over the last 12 to 18 months. One of the major projects, you know, which the city has spoken about over the years has been Hudson Yards. You've been involved with that. What aspects of Hudson Yards? Uh, we were originally involved on behalf of Tishman Spire on negotiating with the MTA. Uh, we went down, we negotiated a letter of intent um, on the east side yards. There were still some open issues on the west side yards. The MTA, Tishman Spire ultimately didn't reach agreement on that. Uh, related uh, became the designated uh, developer for the Hudson Yards and we represented uh, Related on doing all of the zoning, including the zoning for the West Side Yards, which has just recently uh, been approved and is in the process of being completed. Another interesting transaction that you've been involved with is a transaction in many stages. It's the Nets. From the beginning of the Nets, the Nets Yankees, and well, Ray we, Chambers, Alan Landis, and the rest of the crew. We, we represented the, the Nets on um, separating themselves from the Yankees and then selling the Nets to uh, Bruce Ratner. And uh, I had a relationship, a long-standing relationship with Alan Landis, who's one of the principals. We had represented him in selling his portfolio in New Jersey to Boston Properties. Um, Arthur Fleischer, who's one of the senior statesmen of the M&A world uh, with a storied history of transactions, um, had a long-standing relationship with Ray Chambers, one of the other major principals of the Nets. So we represented the Nets in selling the team to, to Bruce Ratner, and then we represented Bruce, uh, particularly my partner Steve Lefkowitz, 
on doing all of the zoning and land use work for the arena, then doing the financing for the arena. Which you had to make sure, you know, it's like the old days in the tax shelter, it had to close before December 31st. It absolutely positively had to close by December 31. We came down to the wire, but the people at Forest City were extraordinary, and there was a, you know, a big team at Fried Frank that cut across disciplinary lines, real estate folks, corporate folks, bond folks, tax folks, and they were all working around the clock to get done by the deadline, which they did. Now, in, in addition to that, I mean, you, you've represented some of the major families, families like the, Res uh, the Resnicks and the MacLeods and a number of their acquisitions and sales of items, you and your partners. Right. I mean, the, the Resnicks I've represented for a long time. We have... Uh, we did the you know financings on 199 Water Street. We did the major lease with Cantor Fitzgerald at 110 East 59th Street. Uh, we did the development of uh, 200 Chamber Street, which is the residential building. Did you they, take care of the Palm also? The and, we, and, 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 and the Palm, and, and the palm and, is and, right and, there, and, the and it's doing very well. I'm very happy with Goldman going up across the Goldman Building going up. Now it gone up across the street. Um, so uh, you know that's been uh, that's been quite extraordinary. Uh, in terms of that relationship. Now, uh, you also, uh, you and your firm have represented Macklow in different, uh, this, in the purchase of, uh, of the uh, office? Well, the purchase of General Motors building. My partner, <coughs> Rob Soren, who is uh, an extraordinary friend and lawyer um, and has been very close to the Macklows from the beginning, um, represented them on acquiring the General Motors building and then on the subsequent disposition of the General Motors building to uh, to Boston properties, and you were also involved with the leasing of the the famous Apple Store, and the leasing of the famous Apple Store. Uh, Rob uh, spent a lot of quality hours with uh, uh, Jeff and Ross, who represented Apple. Uh, you know, and that was vision. a really creative thing because uh, I don't want to age us, but if you remember, they had at one time when it was the general, the initial General Motors building downstairs, the Auto the, Pub, the, the Auto Pub, which was which horrible. Was, was horrible. And then the auto pub closed, and nothing was really there. And you know, uh, it was really a great creativity by Harry, uh, increasing the retail. Harry and 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 Billy really had a vision for what you could do with that below grade space. And um, you know, they had a vision of Apple being able to make a real retail statement there. And I think while they didn't know exactly what the entranceway would be, they decided that you could have a dramatic entranceway at ground level then you could turn that space, which really was space that was difficult to lease and difficult to make successful, into extraordinary space. And, and they really had that vision, and they bid on the GM building based on that vision, plus on the, their vision to be able to extend the retail on the Madison which Avenue they did, side, which, which they, they did. Able. I mean, that vision was <coughs> absolutely extraordinary, came to be, um, you know, Steve Jobs got involved, and they really had a, you know, um, a collaborative effort to come up with a design which was really extraordinary and I think that's become a major tourist attraction. I mean, you yeah, can't come to New York and not go to the go Apple, the Apple store, store or the GM builder. Now, in addition, uh, you know, because real estate has had its ups and downs, now we're in a little down period, uh, you and your firm have also represented Harry uh, Macwell with regard to the Drake site, which has had numerous changes o over the life over there. We have, and uh, the uh, the, the debt on the Drake site was recently acquired and paid off, and the property was acquired by Sim Properties um, out of California. So let's talk about, uh, you, you know, the, the family. It's Wendy, and you have two sons. I have two boys, and my older son, Mark, is 19. At Lehigh. And he's in the business school at Lehigh as a sophomore. And my younger son, Ross, is 15, and he's at uh, Friends Seminary. So do, do you think that uh, the two of them uh, one day you know, we'll, we'll follow Grandpa Mayer's concept of uh, going to the real estate practice or the dental practice or the medical practice? Uh, I don't see the dental or medical, um, but I think they could either become, go into the real estate business or go into the practice of law. I remember post 9-11, we actually went on top, with Scott Resnick, we went on top of... Um, 200 train? One, no, of, on top of 199 Water Street. And Mark was very young at the time, you know, 13. And we, we walked up, we went up to the top of 199, we got a tour of the building, and we got one on top of the building, and Mark started looking around and saying, oh, well, that's one, that's 180 Maiden Lane, and that's one New York, and that's 85 Broad. 
and he started going through it. That's owned, you know, that, that's owned by MetLife, and that's actually owned by Brookfield. And well, Scott, what is, was, is this the dinner discussion? <laughs> uh, you know, Dad, which building did you sell? Which one did you build? You know. Well, there's a lot of real estate that's discussed at the table, and uh, and I think he's kind of grown up. I mean, a lot of our friends are in the industry. Um, you know, whether it's Steve Siegel at CBRE or Bruce Mosler or the Resnicks. I mean, there's just a lot of people that he's come in contact with. With regard to that, you've been very involved in charitable endeavors. And in, my joke was that we had you bomb mitzvah for a couple of months ago when uh, you were on by National uh, Denver Hospital. Uh, that was actually, it was an extraordinary evening. Um, Steve and Wendy Siegel and actually Larry Silverstein had approached me to be the honoree this year. And obviously, this has been a very difficult year. And when they asked me, we were in the most difficult the, the portion, worst right, the worst time of it. And, uh, and I was reluctant to do that. And as a, as a professional, as a lawyer, as opposed to a developer owner, it's, it's, it's even sometimes more difficult to do those things. But they persuaded me that it was, a, it was an important event, it was an important cause, and it was important at this stage in the you know, in kind of the economic cycle to, to step up and be counted. And I agreed to do it. Wendy was very supportive. You know, she was concerned, but very supportive. And, uh, and Steve and Wendy Siegel were extraordinary. Uh, my partners, Rob Soren and Josh Momelstein, really extended themselves. Larry was, uh, was, was fabulous. And then all the people from the industry, I thought, were just stupendous i mean they all a small extended. party right it was a small there was just 1100 of my friends and family who uh, came out and they raised in excess of two million dollars for the hospital and it was just a fabulous evening and uh, and i'm very proud of it you should be and i mean you've stepped in i mean uh i've been involved with a number of these other charitable endeavors also or you've, you've been the man of the year for or you you know you're the man of the year for state of israel bond so you know uh, when it comes to helping the less fortunate you've always been there i think that you gained from your your mother and father over there well i appreciate that i mean i think the industry itself is very philanthropic and i think those those um uh charities that I think the, the real estate industry has adopted have really relied on the industry and I think the industry has been there and this National Jewish Hospital was just an example of that. Uh, it was just, it blew my mind and I think the nicest thing was after you know, the presentations had been made and I made a speech talking about the importance of the hospital and making it very personal and you talk about how it was my bar mitzvah. I kind of related it back to my bar mitzvah and how it was different so and how you, it was the did same. You, did you use the same speech? I used a different speech. You used a different, different speech. Okay. And I said instead of donating the 10% of the proceeds of bar, my bar mitzvah money, we had raised $2 million for the, for the hospital. And that was a rather dramatic change in you know, philanthropic activities. Uh, but when it was all over, my younger son, who was 15, came up to me and uh, gave me a big hug and said, Daddy, I am so proud of you. As you know, that's, you it's can't pay for something like that. That was absolutely extraordinary. So, you know, practice of law, being a real estate developer, working in the business, being the, uh, the true consigliere, you are truly a builder in New York, and I'd like to thank you for being here today. Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Inc., New York's Window Company, New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Beechwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, M&T Bank, Must Development, LLC, Des Moines Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, SJP Properties, 
Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, W Financial Mortgage Fund, the Wickoff Group. 